continuing with the fifth chapter of Cold Comfort Farm. Got everything on my phone straightened out now, so it shouldn't get cut off weirdly again. Um, we continued through the breakfast scene of Flora kind of telling Adam there's a better way to clean porridge off of plates than with a twig. She intends to get him a small mop. And Elfine has come home. And we will pick up from there. My cowling, my little elf, fine, said Adam, listlessly picking up his thorn twig, which had fallen into the snoot of porridge on the hearth. Indeed, and does she always charge about like that? inquired Flora coldly, considering her cousin deficient in manners. Ah, she's wild and shy as a Pharisee of the wood. Days she'll be away from home and wandering on the hills, where only the wild birds and the little rabbits and the spying maggies for company. Aye, and on nights, too, his face darkened. Aye, she's away then, too, wandering far from those that loves her, and cowdled her in their bo bosoms when she was but a moppet, but a, but a moment. She'll break my heart into little snippets, so she will. Does she go to school? asked Flora, looking distastefully in a cupboard for a rag with which to dust her shoes. How old is she? Seventeen, nay, never talk of school. For my win it, why, Robert Post, child, you might as soon send the white hawthorn or the yellow dapple dilly, dappy down dilly to school as my elfine. She learns from the skies and the wild marsh tickets, not out of books. How trying, observed Flora, who was feeling lonely and rather cross. Look here, where is everybody this morning? I want to see Miss Judith, Miss Judith before I go for, out for a walk. Moss Amos, he's down seeing the well drained for Sari Lucy's Polly. We think she's fallen into it. Moss Reuben, he's down Nettle Finch plowing Moss Seth. He's off mollicking somewheres on howling. Miss Judith, she's upstairs a laying out the cards. Well, I shall go up and find her. What does mollicking mean? No, you don't need to. No, you need not tell me. I can guess. What time is lunch? The men has their dinners at twelve. We has ours an hour later. Then I'll come in at one. Does do, ah, uh, I mean, who cooks it? Miss Judith. She cooks the dinner. Ah, was ye feared I would cook it, Robert Post, child? Set ye a black heart at rest. I wouldn't set me hand to cook even a run of bacon for the stark adders. I cooks for the men, and that's all. Flora had the grace to color at her accurate reading of her thoughts, and was glad to hurry upstairs out of his accusing presence. But it was a relief about the cooking. At least she would not have to starve during her visit to Cold Comfort. She had no notion where Judith's bedroom might be, but she found a guide to take her there. As she reached the head of the stairs, the tall girl in the green cloak, who had just dashed through the kitchen, came running lightly down the corridor toward her. She stopped as though shot at the sight of Flora, and stood poised as though for instant flight, doing the startled bird strut. Doing the, stu doing the startled bird stunt, thought Flora, giving her a pleasant smile, or rather smiling at the hood, which half concealed her cousin's face. "'What do you want?' asked Elfine stonily. "'Cousin Judith's bedroom,' returned Flora. "'Would you be a lamb and show me the way? "'It's so easy to get lost in a large house when everything is strange to one.' A pair of blue eyes looked at her steadily above the green hand-woven hood. Flora pensively noted that they were fine eyes, and that the hood was the wrong green. She said persuasively, do forgive my saying so, but I would love to see you in blue. Some shades of green are good, of course, but dull greens are very trying, I always think. If I were you, I should try blue, something really well cut, of course, and very simple, but definitely blue. You try it and see. Elfine made a brusque, boyish movement and said offhandedly, This way. She strode along the corridor with a long, swinging step, letting the hood fall back so that Flora could see the back of her unburnished mane of hair. It might have been a good gold if it had been properly dressed and cared for. It all seemed deplorable to Flora. Here, jerked out Elfine, stopping in front of a closed door. Flora thanked her so much, and Elfine, after another long stare at her, strode away. She would have to be taken in hand at once, thought Flora. Another year. There will be no doing anything with her, and even if she escapes from this place... She would only go and keep a tea room in Brighton and go all arty-crafty about the 
the feet and waist, and sighing a little at the greatness of the task which she had set herself to perform, Flora rapped at Judith's bedroom door, and in reply a muttered and in reply to a muttered Come in entered two hundred photographs of Seth, aged from six weeks to twenty four years, decorated the walls of Judith's bedroom. She sat by the window in a soiled red dressing gown with a dirty pack of cards on the table in front of her. The bed was not made, her hair hung about her face, a nest of lifeless black snakes. "'Good morning,' said Flora. "'I'm sorry to interrupt you if you are busy writing letters. "'I just wanted to know if you would like me to amuse myself and make my own arrangements, "'or would you like me to come in and see you about this time every morning? "'Personally, I think it's much easier if a guest wanders around and finds her own ways of passing the time. "'I am sure you are far too busy to want to bother with looking after me.' "'Judith, after a long stare at her young cousin, flung back her head with its load of snakes. "'The raw air splintered before the harsh onslaught of her laugh. Ha, ha, ha! Busy. Busy weaving my own shroud, be like. Nay, do not you please, do what you please, Robert Post child. If so be you, if so be as you don't break in on my loneliness, give me time, and I will atone for the wrong my man did your fa to your father. Give us all time, the words came draggingly and unwillingly, and we will all atone. I suppose, suggested Flora courteously, you would not care to tell me what the wrong was. I too feel it would make matters a little easier. Judith thrust her words aside with a heavy movement of her hand, like a blind outflinging of a tortured beast. Like the blind outflinging of a tortured beast. Haven't I told you my lips are sealed? Just as you like, of course, cousin Judith, but there is another thing. Then Flora, as delicately as possible, asked her cousin, when and how she should pay to her first installment of a hundred pounds a year, which Flora anticipated that she would keep on hand over the, over to the Stark Adders for her keep. Keep it! Keep it! said Judith violently. We will never touch a hay penny of Robert Post's money. While you are here, you are here as the guest of, co as the guest of cold comfort. Every mid-up you eat is paid for with our sweat. Tez as it should be, seeing the way things are. Flora politely thanked her cousin for her generosity, when she privately resolved that, as soon as it was possible, she would make the acquaintance of Aunt Ida, Do of Aunt Ida Doom, and find out what the old and find out if the old lady approved of this porridgeal arrangement. Flora felt sure of this prodigal arrangement. Flora felt sure she would not approve, and Flora herself was irritated by Judith's remark. For if she lived at cold comfort as a guest. It would be unpardonable impertinence were she to interfere with the family's mode of living. But if she were paying her way, she could interfere as much as she pleased. She had observed a similar situation in houses where there were both poor relations and paying guests. But this was a point which could be settled at some other time. Just now there was something more important to discuss, she said. By the way, I adore my bedroom, but do you think I could have the curtains washed? I believe they are red, and I should so like to make sure. Judith had sunk into a reverie. Curtains, she asked vacantly, lifting her magnificent head. Child, child, it is many years since such trifles broke across the web of my solitude. I'm sure it is, but do you think I might have them washed all the same? Could Adam do them? Adam, his frail arms have not the strength. Miriam, the hired girl might have done them, but her gaze stayed again to the her gaze straight again to the window, past whose open casements a fine rain was blowing. Flora, who was willing to try anything once, gazed too. Judith was looking at a little hut which stood at the far end of Nettle Flitchfield, and almost abutted upon the sage pieces which railed in the yard. From this hut came distant cries of distress in a female voice. Flora looked at her cousin, with inquiring eyebrows, Judith nodded, lowered her eyelids, while a slow scarlet wave of blood swept over her breast and cheeks. "'Tis the hired girl in labor,' she whispered. "'What? Without a doctor or anything?' asked Flora in alarm. "'Hadn't we better send Adam down to howling for one? I mean, in that grim-looking hut and everything.' Judith made again made the blind animal gesture, gesture of repudiation, which seemed to thrust the sodden wall of negation between herself 
in the world of living things. Her face was grey. Leave her in peace. Animals like Miriam are best alone at such times. Tis not the first time. Too bad, said Flora sympathetically. Tis the fourth time, whispered Judith thickly. Every year in the fullness of summer, when the sukbine hangs heavy from the wains, tis the same, and when the spring comes, her hour is upon her again. Tis the hand of nature, and we women cannot escape it. Oh, can't we, thought Flora with spirit, but aloud she only made such noises of tut-tutting regret as she felt were appropriate to the occasion. Well, she's out of the question anyway, she said briskly. What question? asked Judith after a pause. She had fallen into a trance-like muse. Her face was grey. I mean the curtains. She can't wash them. If she's just had a baby, can she? She will be about again tomorrow. Such wenches are like the beasts of the field, said Judith indifferently. She seemed bowed under the gnawing weight of a sorrow that had left her too exhausted for anger. But as she spoke, an asp-like gleam of contempt darted into her over-lidded eyes. She looked quickly at Ross at, the photograph, at a photograph of Seth which stood on the table. It showed him in the center of the beer shown Wanderer's football club. His young man's limbs, sleek in their dark male pride, seemed to disdain the covering offered them by the brief shorts and striped jersey. His body might have been naked, like his full-muscled throat, which rose round and proud as the male organ of a flower from the neck of his sweater. He is thought too, he is thought too fat. But really very handsome, mused Flora, following Judith's glance. I don't suppose he plays football any more. Probably Moloch's instead. Ay, whispered Judith. Look at him, the shame of our house. Cursed be the day I brought him forth, and the nourishment he drew from my bosom, and the wooing tongue God gave him brings disgrace upon weak women. She stood up and looked out into the drizzling rain. The cries of the little hut from the little hut had stopped. An exhausted silence brimmed with the, ener with the enervating weakness which followed a stupendous effort, mounted from the stagnant air in the yard like a miasma, all the surrounding surface of the countryside, the huddled downs lost in rain, the wet fields fanged abruptly with, with flints, the leafless thorns thrust sideways by the internal pawing of the wind, the lush breeding miles of meadow through which lifeless rivers wan river wandered, seemed to be folding inward upon themselves. Their dumbness said, Give up, there is no answer to the riddle, only that bodies return exhausted hour by hour, minute by minute, to the all-forgiving and all-comprehending primeval slime. Well, Cousin Judith, if you really think she will be about again in a few days, perhaps I might look in at her hut this morning and arrange about the curtains, said Flora, preparing to go. Judith did not answer at first. The fourth time, she whispered at last, four of them, love children, pa, that animal, and love, and he, Flora realized that the conversation was not likely to take a turn in which she could join with any benefit, so she went quickly away. So they all belong to Seth, she thought, while putting on her Macintosh in her bedroom. Really, it is too bad. I suppose, on any other farm, one would say that it set a bad example, but of course that does not apply here. I must see, I think, what can be done about Seth. She picked her way through the mud and rancid straw which carpeted the yard without encountering anyone except a person whom she took for his em from his employment to be Reuben himself. He was feverishly collecting the feathers dropped by the chickens, straying about the yard and, and comparing them in number with the empty feather sockets on the bodies of the chickens. This, she supposed, must be a precautionary measure to prevent any feathers being taken away by Mark Dollar to his daughter Nancy. Reuben, if it were he, was so engrossed that he did not observe Flora. And that is the end of chapter 5.